Everybody's loaded up for the ride? Oh, very good. God, it, it's always amazing to see all the beautiful places or faces. Beautiful venue, isn't it? I um, have been by this, I, I don't know how many times, down University Avenue and just never really knew what was in here. Uh, what, what's really amazing is we're going to spend time tonight talking about the pace of digital transformation. And I don't know if you know, but this place used to be a movie theater. And then it went from being a movie theater to being a bookstore. And now it's an open work space for everybody to come in and do all their digital transformation stuff. So it's really exciting that where we are also is kind of going to represent what we're talking about tonight. Um, have a very, very exciting uh, group of speakers tonight, as you know. And uh, you know, my job is just to kind of tee things up tonight. As those of you who know me, you know, I could talk for five hours. And it's very, very hard to only talk for a few minutes and, and, and bring others on. But just very, very excited to do this. Uh, one thing I do want, um, and, and my, my sons will laugh at me because I always have to do a selfie. And by the way, it's my, my son Tyler's 20th birthday tonight. So he made this major sacrifice to be here. But a couple of things. So this is being live streamed actually around the world. And when I say around the world, I mean around the world. There are people in India that are, that, that are in. There are people in Spain. Uh, there are folks actually in uh, United Arab Emirates who are, who are uh, going to be on and watching. And, and of course, we're recording. We'll have this content online as well. So the first thing I want to do is I am going to take a selfie, but I want you to make a lot of noise because they have to be able to hear you in Spain because tomorrow we're going to have to tell them what happened. So can you all say that you're here? <laughs> very good. That's awesome. No, very, very cool. I, um, so I can tell it's going to be a great crowd. If I can, this clicker, by the way, is the most awesome clicker I've ever had. Uh, we got this, and it actually, if you can put it on a timer, with five minutes to go, it actually buzzes and tells you it's time's coming up. I, um, so, so let's talk about 5 and 25. Um, I, you know, we, we talk about transformation a lot. And, and, and Steve and I, and I have to tell you, first of all, when, uh, Steve, um, my, my uh, business or co-founder, and I talk about digital transformation and what it means, and really the, the, the pace of transformation uh, that's happening all around us and, and how that's impacting every single thing that we're all doing. And, and we see that very acutely in our personal lives as well as in our work lives and, and, and just the way that we're learning and growing and so on. And so what we're very excited about is this you know, kind of shift to this new realm uh, but us as humans, and it's really strange to hear the word humans because when I've got involved in this digital transformation thing, people talk about humans and they talk about machines. They don't say people. And it's really interesting for me that they don't say people. I mean, to me, it's what do you mean humans? Um, but the reality is our reality is changing very quickly. And, and we have to make sure that we understand how we're going to adapt and how things are changing. So change in five, not 25, is this new reality of, you know, we had it the old days where, you know, we had 25 years, basically, you know, life was in three segments, and there's books written on this, but where the first 25 years of our life was all about education, whether it was our parents or school or whatever it was, or getting trained to get into the workforce, it was all about education. The second third is when we worked, and sometimes that third kind of extended out, and, and hopefully the last third, we got to retire, we kind of started scaling down and so on. In today's world, things are changing so much faster because industries are changing so much faster that we have to figure out how to actually adapt in, in five-year increments as opposed to 25-year increments. And things are really, as they evolve, we all have to think differently and we have to think about how industries and, and individuals um, actually can be obsoleted because of the pace of industry. And, and how do you pivot into this new world? And so that's what we're going to focus on tonight. I, I have to say, I, um, this idea came about with having this particular group come and speak. Uh, we had a board meeting where we were talking about ISD and the curriculum for the year uh, a few weeks ago in my house. And everybody around the table was talking about what we're going to go do and how we're going to attack digital transformation. And everybody had a very, very different viewpoint, but we all came to the same place. We thought that'd be a good conversation to talk about today and really take those different angles as we go through this. Um, you know, is the, I, I, I have to tell you, I, I feel, and not a good word, but I feel naked when I'm up here without my buddy Steve. 
uh, because typically when we speak, we speak together and, and we go back and forth and talk about, you know, of course the master's degree program that we have and, and you know, I, I, I strongly encourage you to go look at this online. Um, didn't want to uh, spend too much time on that. Um, but really the, the thing that, you know, I'm very, very much focused on the program itself and, and, and the knowledge piece of it and what we have to do to get the program approved by the state of California and so on. And Steve, um, having come from LinkedIn and understanding the networking piece and what that means, um, the combination of those two are what we find so valuable about what we're trying to do. And also the baseline of what has to be done as you kind of deal with this new reality that's out there. Uh, we are you know, looking at this new world um, and our vision is really as we look at this new world, it is digital, we all have to embrace it. And, and we don't mean embrace it because, you know, 20 year olds are gonna come out of college or 22 year olds are gonna come out, but it means that 40 year olds have to find a new orbit. And, and we all have to figure out how to pivot in this new, uh, this new realm to be able to, you know, get to the next level. So, um, one thing that's very important, and you know, when you, when you look at your cards that are in front of you, you'll see a lot of really cool speakers with a lot of really neat backgrounds. I could spend 15 minutes on each person telling you what they've done. Um, it's really, they just have an amazing background. I'll let you do that. But I think what's really important for you to understand is that in our program, that, that uh, in our 16 module program for a master's degree, the folks that are presenting tonight are actually professors in our program as well. They're not just here to present because they're on a board. They actually uh, run that particular module and they actually do the master class of that module and bring other folks in to, to teach the rest of it. So you're gonna hear firsthand from the folks that were involved, um, that are involved in the program um, in delivering what we call the MEB. And by the way, um, you know, this program came out of Spain um, and we call the masters in internet business the MEB over there and our graduates are MEBers. And so what they have is they have two kind of events. One is ISD Talks, which is what we're doing tonight, which is kind of more about the future of things. And then the other one are me beer events, <laughs> where our alumni in Spain, of course, get together to have beers. So whoever's here tonight, you're gonna get invited to a me beer event. I'm very careful about calling it a me beer event here in the US, so we'll have to come up with a different name, but really excited about also uh, doing that. Um, so we, ha we do have a full agenda. Um, and after, you know, I, I, I'm done here, uh, Greg and Jenny will come up and, and you can kind of see the modules that they run and um, each one, as we said, is gonna take a different approach on this conversation about um, five and 25. And then, of course, you can't have a university without having classroom, classwork. So on your seats, there's a little card on your seats that has a little bit of a homework assignment. And on that homework assignment, and we're going back to kindergarten in terms of what you're gonna get out of this, by the way, but on that card, what we'd like you to do is read the card and then on the back of the card, just tell us what digital transformation means to you. If you wanna put your name, that'd be great. If you just wanna put your first name and a last initial or if you don't wanna put anything, that's fine too. But what we'd like to do is share this socially afterwards so this conversation and what we're doing tonight continues beyond this evening. Okay, now the cool thing about it is everybody that knows me knows you cannot leave an event without dessert. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna trade those cards for cookies. So what we're gonna do is in between and that's why you see cards for cookies. So we'll pass and you guys have to make sure you do this properly because we can't take too much time. But there'll be trays that go down the, down the aisles and we'll trade those cards for cookies. At the same time, there's another card that you'll find and if questions come to mind during uh, the first few presentations, just jot down questions and we'd like to actually capture those from you at the break. And then we'll have Lauren, Gary and Steve come up and speak and then after them, um, all of us are gonna come back on stage and, and actually answer your questions. And at that point, while we're gathering, we'll also an, uh, ask for your questions again from, uh, from the next set of speakers. And, and then, you know, our uh, goal is to, to finish here at nine. We'd like to be on time and make sure that we do that. So we'll, we'll continue uh, from there. Um, before I move forward in this, I'm gonna look at my list because I wanna make sure I don't forget. There's several organizations and people that I wanna thank. Um, if you haven't seen the marquee, uh, look at the marquee because it's really cool because we're up in lights, right? It says, is the Tox Premier and uh, with Bank of Internet and SVO. Uh, the Bank of Internet has been very kind to actually sponsor our food tonight and also um, sponsor uh, several scholarships for our program that you'll see on our website. So thank you, Bank of Internet. Uh, thank you, Michelle in the back there who's, um, who's here from Bank of Internet. 
Um, the Silicon Valley organization, the SVO, is Matt here? Matt is right there. Hi, Matt. Uh, Matt's the, uh, what are you now, Matt? Are you CEO or president? And uh, Yeah, he's the tallest CEO and president in the Valley, by the way, you see? <laughs> and <laughs> so, um, so Matt has adopted us, and, and, and as has the SVO, and we are actually, amazingly, if you go to the Silicon Valley organization, the office that we're all in right now, uh, working on ISTE, is Matt's old office. So he actually moved out of his office to have us come in. And, and we're going to be teaching our first classes there. So thank you, and thank you to, to Catherine and Amanda and, and, and Nancy for all your help in, in um, in, or you know, supporting the, the event tonight. I also want to thank the ISD team and family for, for everything that they do all the time. And, and I don't want to mention everyone because as soon as I do, I'll forget someone and I'll screw that up. And um, Michael and Jonathan on video, um, thank you so much. These are friends of uh, the family. And then uh, Miss Chrisella up here, who's our uh, marketing guru and does all kinds of things for us and is just wonderful to, to deal with. Um, lastly, I'd like to thank all of you for coming. Um, really appreciate the fact that uh, you've taken the time to come tonight, and hopefully uh, you'll enjoy the evening. And with that, what I'd like to do is introduce uh, my friend, uh, Greg Petroff, um, who's going to start the evening with his view on sure. 5 and 25. Thank you. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Greg Petroff, and I'm going to talk a little bit about a designer's perspective. In the ISD program, I manage the design thinking and user experience modules. And I want to talk a little bit about why design matters right now and some of the things that are happening from a technical perspective that are making design a skill that people may want to have acquired um, along the way. It doesn't mean you have to become a designer, but there are a set of methods that designers use that are incredibly useful and becoming more important in organizations as we move forward. So like, what's going on right now? So um, there are a bunch of emergent trends that you hear people talk about in the Valley, uh, from machine learning, Internet of Things, um, the big discussion around security, uh, both in sort of our political realm, but also just in terms of how people work, uh, edge computing, um, and I'll talk a little more about that in a second, blockchain. These are all you know, technical advancements that are occurring at a kind of a blistering pace, and they all mean different things. So in the machine learning space, um, this space is moving dramatically fast right now. So a little bit over a year ago, uh, Google's uh, DeepMind uh, beat the world champion Go player. And it did it in a way that was really novel and no one had seen before. And it was considered an impossible game for a computer to learn. And there was a learning model that was created in DeepMind that was able to beat you know, the, the, the greatest player in the world. And that started to demonstrate the power of AI. So we're hearing a lot of that conversation going on. You know, I work in Google right now. There's a lot of conversations in Google around um, machine learning, artificial intelligence, but there are many other people working in the field. And this space is moving very rapidly. So the notion of training systems to understand behavior in the world is really going to dramatically change our world. Uh, Internet of Things, uh, Cisco estimates that there will be 50 billion devices connected by 2020, all with their own unique URL, uh, talking in the Internet, uh, that uh, people talk about your refrigerator. This is probably more like pumps and machinery and equipment that sort of power our world, electrical systems, et cetera. But it's going to dramatically improve the efficiency of our infrastructure and change the way that systems are delivered and how maintenance is done, right? So you're going to see uh, in the aircraft industry, uh, you know, you'll see condition-based uh, maintenance. So they'll take a jet engine off wing when it needs to, not on a regular basis, but based on the operating behavior of that engine, based on the analysis and some deep learning models that are connected to it. So this IoT space is going to dramatically change uh, how our world uh, manages resources. Um, security. We talk a lot about security in the world right now. I think the greatest threat to security is actually humans. Uh, we make mistakes along the way. Um, but uh, there's a huge conversation around cloud right now, and one of the primary draws towards cloud is it is fundamentally a more secure environment than most corporate IT environments. So uh, a lot of transition and conversations around how do I secure my information, uh, how do I keep people from accessing it. Uh, we've certainly seen uh, the weaponization of malware and those kinds of things happening. It's becoming a huge trend that we have to be paying attention to. 
Uh, edge compute, um, you know, the cost of a CPU is so inexpensive now that for high value assets, why not put 100 cores right next to it and run analytics at the edge so that you can understand how machines are operating and uh, give better insights into their operation. So again, dramatic changes in terms of how things could happen. What happens when the MR machine at the hospital has um, artificial intelligence and 1,000 cores and can crunch through that data and give you a much more precise uh, diagnosis from a healthcare perspective than it currently can, and the cost factor of adding that improvement to that MR machine is basically negligible because the cost of the compute has become so inexpensive. And then things like blockchain, right? So, you know, secure transactions which um, enable uh, communities to exchange value with each other. And, you know, in the blockchain world, it's financial, but it could be used for a variety of other things, um, are changing the, our notion of how we connect things together. So all of this transformation is going on under our noses at the moment. And of course, we have all these disruptive platforms. And you know, we've seen them. These are all the usual use cases. Uh, things in the financial services like Stripe, which is a payments engine, or Square. Uh, in the logistics side, you know, Lyft and Uber. Uh, housing, Airbnb, what it's done to uh, the hotel marketplace is pretty remarkable. And computing infrastructure, things like Amazon Web Services or Google's cloud platform. These are dramatically changing you know, how people can build software. And I'll talk a little bit in a moment about what I think that means. So the first part that I want to talk about very quickly is this notion of disruptive business models. A non-incumbent can enter a business space with the technology platforms that exist today with a new business model and disrupt that incumbent player. And if you're not, if you haven't been disrupted yet, you need to be pay paying attention to the fact that someone could enter your marketplace and disrupt. So there's a huge opportunity for uh, people in this room who learn these skills to go work for standard brick and mortar organizations, companies and groups that have been around for a long time and just bring the ability to look at the future in a new way and bring new business models as a service, the share economy thinking uh, to the conversation. Uh, we talk about infrastructure as a service, right? So this is what uh, part of the Google Cloud Platform or what AWS does. Uh, this is you know, the rental of compute, right? Instead of having to have your own data center, you rent time on somebody else's data center that can provide that service at less cost and can scale elastically. So if you're a very small startup in a garage and you come up with a great idea and everyone wants to buy it, you don't have to worry about it. They'll scale with you automatically. You can grow um, based on need. Um, platform as a service. So this is this notion of decomposing software into small Lego bricks that you build and assemble to build software applications. And this is changing the way that we build software. In the past, if you had to build a software application, you did the whole thing. You did entitlements, and you did database, and you did the core logic, and you did the IP that was unique to your application. Now you can pretty much consume most everything that you need as a service and just focus your attention on a very small window of what's special about your company. And you can take products to market that might have taken 18 months in a matter of 10 to 12 weeks. And that dramatically changes the game. That means that you could be doing very well in a market and someone could come in with a software application and disrupt you very quickly with not a lot of effort. Uh, and then obviously software as a service, right? So the ability to have a software platform that people can rent as a model. And the interesting thing is if you look at this model, uh, and you think of a, a traditional software as a service platform like Salesforce, uh, you know, they built CRM and they had to build the whole thing. They had to build their, the business model, they had to build their own infrastructure, they had to build their own platform as a service, and then they deliver CRM. If you were building CRM today, you wouldn't do that. You would go rent time on Google's cloud platform or AWS, you'd do your own platform as a service, you would subscribe to services from other vendors, and you would focus your attention on building the best CRM application possible but buying everything else as a commodity from somebody else. And then the last smile there is really experience as a service. How do we create compelling applications that, are, uh, that fit like a glove for your consumer? For the audience that you're trying to attract, how do you build something that meets their needs, that feels like it's part of what they're doing? It's becoming easier and easier to do. So there's this whole new set of things happening. And what it means is there's a new way to build. And this new way to build has different rules to it than what people have experienced in the past. Um, and we also are in this other kind of moment where 
the way that we think about building systems is different as well. So in the past, you know, we used to think about systems of record, right? You know, if you're in the business space, enterprise resource platforms, ERP, um, you know, it had lots of different applications that allow you to do your travel or book your expenses or manage your HR profile. Um, then we moved into sort of the world of systems of engagement, which is you know, the Facebooks of the world, where it's all about the social graph and communicating with people. And we're now moving into this new area of what I would call a system of assets, where it's all about you. And context is what's king. Everything is coming towards you at that moment. The systems are smart enough to triangulate all the desires that you have to provide you context and information that you find valuable. And maybe it's not valuable to someone else, but it's valuable to you. So this notion of context first is really interesting, right? Algorithms are gonna to start to determine our experience. Uh, they're gonna decide, hey, I know where you are. You're at Hana House and you're drinking blue bottle coffee and you're meeting with your friends at ISD, so I'm gonna make you an offer based on those three pieces of information that could be valuable to you. Um, we're gonna see all these disparate data systems are much easier to connect to each other through APIs. So it's easier to mash up and build you know, interesting systems. And certainly location, as I talked about a second ago, is going to become very, very important. We already know this when we're out in the world with our phones and we decide we're hungry and we go Yelp and we look for you know, a restaurant near where we are. Uh, and then the behavior model is really gonna be focused on you know, a unit of one, like what your interests are. So a lot going on. And you know, the CEO of the company I work for right now has talked about this move to an AI, AI first world. Uh, where assistants are going to become more prevalent in the things that we do. So, wow, a lot of change going on. So, what do we do with that? How do companies consume all that change? How do they manage through that? And there are some issues that we have to address. So, the first part is that nobody actually understands the new ingredients, right? This is almost like learning new cooking. Um, you have a mental model that people have carried around for a very long time, and there's a lot of ambiguity and uncertainty. What happens to me if someone enters into my market and disrupts me? How do I become activated in this environment where there's so much change happening so fast? Back to what Amir talked about, the five years instead of 25 year pattern. It might even be a one year pattern that you're worried about. And I think one of the things that's interesting about the ISD program is we're gonna be teaching people how to be more facile and adaptive in this environment. And the big reason why this happens is business today, the prediction framework, their mental model of how to solve problems is based on 20 years of experience and the world changed and no one noticed that it changed. And so that experience is actually not that relevant to problem solving today. No one actually knows how to cook with the new ingredients. And so it's a problem. We have a new ingredients and we need to learn how to build some, you know, make a, a new meal that tastes good. Now the good news is how to build is solved. We have all this infrastructure that makes it super easy for us to build applications and experiences and digital environments um, and change businesses altogether. And if you can master that toolkit, you can transform businesses. The big problem is what to build and why. And that's the problem that I think that faces a lot of companies today. They, they, they look at their existing business model and they say, We've been successful, but is it going to continue to be successful? What do we do next? How do we get to the next condition? So uh, one of the solutions I will provide is to start to learn to think like a designer. And why is that the case? So designers, uh, design is kind of core to, to, to strategy. Designers are, um, they're sort of ifnographers. It's a term I invented, but anyway, they're, they, they're the what if people. Right? They generate lots and lots of ideas. They're, they're possibilitarians, uh, for lack of a better term, right? And, and so um, sometimes they're not good at converging, but they can definitely give you and test lots and lots of ideas. And that generative process that design goes through is really useful in this new environment because no one knows what the path is, so why not just start making things? Um, you know, research, design thinking, this process of, of, of getting customer-centric, watching people uh, at work, observing your customers, getting close to them is becoming more and more important. Um, this notion of learning to be abductive instead of deduct deductive, abductive, this notion of exploring the possible range of outcomes um, is a really important construct uh, to learn how to do. Uh, designers are great at this word juxtaposition. All that means is you take two crazy ideas and you put them together, you know, Preschool, taco, restaurant, put them together, what do you get, right? 
well, that's an awesome idea, right? So, um, you know, maybe it works, maybe it doesn't, but the notion of composition actually allows you to find new things. And the big process is around making. And my position right now is we do way too much thinking before we make things, and we need to learn how to make to think over thinking to make. And so that, if I could leave you with one idea that we're gonna try to teach in this uh, program, or one idea just to take back to where you work in this new world where all these new ingredients, the way to learn how to cook is to start cooking. And some of it's not gonna taste very good at first, um, but eventually you'll figure it out, and then you'll be the first people to bring that new meal to an audience, and you'll be incredibly successful, and the opportunities are really, really awesome. And so I think the last slide I'll give you is kind of where we're headed. Uh, you know, today we're in this very sort of um, incrementalism mindset. Businesses are like, I just want to make it 5% faster, 2% cheaper. Um, we need to move more to a contextual environment where uh, there's more collaboration, more work. And in the future, the stage three space for business, from my perspective, is really about multidisciplinary strategy teams. It's about customer councils getting really, really close to who your consumer is and knowing them really well, and learning adaptive product development so that you can move really fast. And with that, I think I'm done. So um, I'd love to invite uh, Jenny Ming uh, from Charlotte Roos up to come talk to us. And she's going to talk to us a little bit about living in this crazy environment. <laughs> Thank you. Actually, I understood some of the things you talked about, so that's a great thing. Um, thank you all for coming today. Um, I am here to talk about uh, disruption in retail. Um, so as you know, retail has always been about change, especially in apparel retailing. If there's no change or newness, why would you even need to buy new things? So our goal has always been bringing new things and changing. Um, I remember you know, what Don Fisher said, uh, many, many years ago, he was the founder of The Gap. And he always said, if you don't change in retail, you die. And of course, at that time, I thought it was a little dramatic. Um, today, I think about what he said and I realize how true that is. And it's not so much about change, it's how fast you need to change. So in retail, especially apparel retail, it has been about product. Um, we've been very much a product-centric business model for many, many years. If you have the right product, an innovative product, you will win. It was a push model. Um, we always tell you what the trends are, what you need to buy, what you need to wear. Today, all that has changed to a consumer-centric model. I think you heard it from Greg. We are closer to our customer than ever before. And this is all new to us in retail. Product is still important, but now that is a given. Is, a, is table state. The consumer now holds the power of engaging with you whenever and wherever they want. They have infinite choices. So how we used to start a new season would be what we call a product life cycle. From, from spotting and researching trends to designing the product to manufacturing to finally hitting it in the store. Today we don't talk about that. We start with the consumer or customer journey. Um, it's about understanding his or her lifestyle and the touch points that are important to them, understanding the motivation and behavior analytics, which is something we never used to talk about. So I remember how having a really good eye for product was the answer to everything. Today, having the right data to help us better understand and make better decisions is a very important component. So I care about when she's searching for an item to help me decide when to bring something in. So remember, you used to see heavy fall item in the middle of summer, like right now, in the middle of July, and then you see all these sweaters and jacket coming in. And then it would be sitting on the shelves or in the store for a good two months before anybody is really interested in buying it. And, you know, that has all changed. Customer data has now helped us decide when is the timing for a seasonal product? When should we bring it in? And when should we mark it down? There is so much great information we didn't have before to help us with our business. So part of that is really using it and be smart about it. 
So growth used to be come from opening many, many stores. Today, growth comes from what the increase of your e-commerce business is, which is very different. Today, bricks and mortar is struggling with decline in traffic. Store closure are at record high in the tens and thousands. Um, I am sure you have seen all the headlines yourself. This is worse than the 2008 recession. The forecast from analysts is that one in every four malls will be closed. We are oversaturated with retail space. So if we compare ourselves to maybe every 100 American customer with our Canadian counterpart, we have 40% more retail space than they do. And compared to UK, we have five times more space than they do. Both are substantially less than what we have. So, so you could only imagine what we're doing is really something is very necessary. So we used to go to the mall and browse and get inspiration. Today, over 60% of our browsing or research before buying starts with our phone. With that, he or she can decide where they want to go, who has the best price, and who is in stock. They can choose shopping in a physical store or shopping online. Convenient, efficiency, customer service, and reviews all play in their decisions. So of course, Amazon, of course today is Prime Day, right? Amazon has changed how customers shop. They are now the largest apparel retailer online. They don't just sell commodity. Uh, at $16 billion in apparel, they have 30% of the e-commerce apparel business. And by 2021, it is projected they will own 50% of the apparel online. So expectation of e-commerce in total retail will, grow, will be growing double digits. Last year, it hit $2 trillion worldwide out of 22 trillion, which is about 6% of the total. By 2020, it's three years from now, it will be four trillion out of 27 trillion. So it makes it 15% of all retail will be online. So of course, you know, China is leading the way with the largest e-commerce economy in the world. It already has 15.5% of the total retail is done online. 36% of the population buy online at least once a week. What has propelled the growth has been the expansion of middle class, greater mobile, and internet penetration, and growing competition of e-commerce players and improving logistic and infrastructure, especially mobile payment, has all fueled their growth. The Chinese consumer used their mobile to pay their purchase 50 times more than the American consumer. So you can imagine how fast they're growing and why they're growing. So online and offline is something that used to be very separate in the world. So with the rise of e-commerce, especially mobile, the line is certainly blurring very rapidly. And the best model is really an omni model in retailing of converging online and offline. And offline, offering consumer options to shopping online with home delivery, or shopping online and picking up from the store, shopping in store and taking merchandise away, or shopping in store and delivered to your home or office. All these possibilities are giving customer what, whatever options they want. The consumer really, really, truly rules. So with that downgrade of stores, you would think that there would be less investment in stores. Not true. In fact, many retailers are pushing to improve the shopping experience. The malls are also diversifying and being more thoughtful and resourceful about the tenant they're bringing in, bringing in more excitement, more experience in the mall. So physical stores are always, you know, when you think about it, limit to how much assortment you can have. The online stores are now our new flagship stores with more product extension and exclusive. The brand expression is important in all channels, not just one, all of them. So when I was telling a mayor that I was um, leaving for Paris and London this week, he asked if I was going to see any of the fashion shows. And first I said, first I said, I wish. <laughs> but the answer is no. Why? Also today, because all the fashion shows 
pretty much all the design are now live stream online. So I can be anywhere and see any shows around the world wherever I am. Uh, this, is, this is one of the reasons why fashion trends can be inspired much faster than ever before. This is the reason why fast fashion like Zara and H&M can bring runway fashion to their customer faster than ever before. Everything is happening faster and more available in any price points, all to the impact of the internet. This is one of the many, many things that have changed. And then seriously, I probably could go on and on for hours about all the changes that's happening in retail. But if you are in retail today, it's definitely a disruptive time. It's not easy. Uh, you really have to have an iron stomach to be in this business today. It's also the best time to reinvent and transform with so many possibilities and opportunities. You know, what I want to do is really give all of you a, just a small glimpse into what is happening in the e-commerce space with the bricks and mortar. And um, I'm very excited about, you know, being part of ISD and really promoting digitalization in retail, in organization, and also in your own personal life. So with that, I'm gonna pass it back to Amir because I heard about cookies and cards and all that kind of stuff. Thank you. Thank you. It's funny. Is this working? Okay, very good. No, Jenny and I met um, on the San Jose State Tower Board um, back in late 2009, early 2010. And every time I would talk to her, she was going off to Korea or somewhere else to go to a fashion show. And as she said now, now she's just sitting on the internet looking at what's happening around her. So the, the world definitely does change very quick. Okay. No, very good. What I'm gonna do is while the rest of the cookies are being handed out, I'm gonna introduce our newest board member, uh, Lauren Vaccarello. And Lauren is um, the, the Vice President of Marketing, uh, di all digital marketing for Box um, up, in, up in the right. city. Yep. And i um, just really happy to have her on board and, and she's gonna be doing the digital marketing module for us. And today she's gonna tell you about digital marketing past and the future. Cool. Thank you. Sounds you, good. You're already hooked up. Oh, do I need a so clicker? Need awesome. awesome. Thank you. Um, so one thing that I learned about this clicker is it works from the parking lot. So we had a running joke that we were gonna steal the clicker and start advancing people's slides and see if they could, see if they can catch up. Um, I don't think anyone's done that to me, but we'll find out. Uh, so hi everybody, um, hopefully I will get you before the sugar coma hits and then we'll bring Gary up and then see what happens. Uh, so I'm Lauren Vaccarello, so quick overview of the next 10 or 15 minutes of your life. Uh, I'll give you a quick about me, who I am, why I'm here. Uh, uh, I think it's important before we're talking about the future to know where you are today and to know where you've come from. So I'll spend a couple of minutes talking about where I, where I came from, where the industry came from, what's happening right now, and then I'm a very practical person. So things that are going to be useful for you today. Uh, oh, this really does work from anywhere. Uh, so a little bit about me. Um, so, long story short, I started in digital marketing about 15 years ago. Uh, very different world in digital marketing. Uh, throughout the course of my career, I used to run digital at Salesforce, and digital at Salesforce was very, very different. Uh, this was 2009. Digital wasn't a thing at Salesforce. They didn't really use it. There was this misconception that we're selling to senior IT executives they're not gonna use the internet to do research because what, who uses the internet? Um, and then I uh, ended up going to a company called AdRoll, it's a marketing technology company to build out global marketing. Uh, and now at Box, I lead a lot of functions in marketing, both sort of digital and a lot of your traditional functions, which I get a kick out of because I get to apply a lot of digital methodologies to really traditional functions like throwing a 8,000 person event. Um, Super interesting for people who have small children that have trouble sleeping. Uh, I wrote two books. Uh, one is all about B2B online marketing, and one is about retargeting. So if you have small kids, these are perfect. Uh, so quick history lesson. Um, so who can guess what year this is? So like, we're gonna go way back. This is, oh. So this is 2002, you can tell by the red leather pants. 
Fun fact, I had a pair of red leather pants in 2002. Um, there's no pictures on the internet. It was pre-social media. So if you think about 2002, when you kind of go back to time, very different world than it is today, and it's important to anchor yourself in what the world looked like in 2002. Britney Spears hadn't shaved her head and gone crazy yet. Uh, she and Justin Timberlake were dating velour tracksuits, super in style, um, as were red leather pants. The Euro just came out. Um, Eminem was a newer up and coming artist and my big fat Greek wedding, really popular movie. But this is how I remember 2002. So 2002, I was just getting started in digital marketing. And we all know a world right now where you wanna go digital, you have all of your searches on Google, you jump on Facebook, this is, and you start to delve into social media. In 2002, there was Google, but there was also Ask Jeeves and Lycos and Inktomy and AltaVista and Yahoo and Overture and then a handful of these small search engines. I remember, because I was also bartending, because there was no real money in this in 2002, um, when I started in digital in 2002, it's not a respectable career choice. This isn't something you tell your kids they should go do. This isn't something any of you would aspire to be in digital. Literally, my desk was in the hallway because I was the digital person. No one really cared. And I wasn't really, I wasn't really doing it as a career choice. I needed health insurance. I was a bartender. Life was fine. Also, who you got to do digital marketing at the time was that bartender chick who seemed really smart and needed health insurance. Uh, <laughs> um, it was pre-Obamacare as well. Um, and I will never forget working at a bar and talking to someone that said, you know, I just got this new job. It seems really good. I'm learning about digital. And I'm learning about Google and search engine optimization and paid search. And the person at the top bar said, you know, none of that really matters because I just use, um, I just use Dogpile and none of the stuff that you do to make things rank works on Dogpile. It's, it's totally different because Dogpile was a search engine um, for anyone who actually remembers that. Um, so 2002 was a very, very different world. So there's a few fundamental truths with what the world looked like in 2002. Like I said, digital, not a respectable job. This is the thing you probably fell into. Um, fun fact of a lot of where this started was what industries were getting into digital the fastest. Um, also, not necessarily the most respectable industries. It was people selling drugs online. Honestly, it was the porn industry. It was casinos. This is where a lot of the innovation was starting. And if you think about that now, I can tell you the first job that I had um, online was working at an online dating company in 2002, before online dating was a socially acceptable thing. Also, why we won't find that on any social media profile for me. Because 2002, working at an online dating site, not a thing you did. Um, there's also no such thing as formal education. There's no class you can take. I had message boards, I had forums, there's people chatting online. That's how I learned how to do this. There was. Everyone had nicks or nicknames, and that's what you knew. So you'd go to these events, and you'd say, well, I'm Lauren. Well, no, no, who are you really? And you'd say whatever your handle was, because that's how you knew each other. A really good point of context for everybody, so all spending online was $6 billion a year. Might sound like a lot of money. So let's think about where we are today. Um, $72 billion was spent online last year. So 15 years ago, it was $6 billion. Now over $72 billion is spent online. It, the spend online has actually just overtaken what advertisers spend on TV. This is a monumental moment that online isn't what that slightly technical woman does who sits in the desk in the hallway. This is the most important thing that you do as part of your marketing budget. Really interesting fun fact for you, um, the number one way you'd spend money in 2002 online was search. Do you know what the number two biggest spend online was in 2002? Classified ads. Do you know how much money got spent on classified ads last year? Nothing. And the reason I tell you this is because what was the second most important thing in 2002 is completely irrelevant today. 
Um, also, really interesting that's happening right now, your mobile spend has officially outpaced your desktop. $35 billion was spent on mobile last year. Go back in time. The iPhone just came out 10 years ago. This wasn't even a concept in people's brains 10 years ago that the money you're going to spend advertising on your phone, that thing you use to call people, is more important than what you spend on a desktop. Social media spend last year was over $16 billion. Social media didn't exist at that point in time. And the reason that I'm telling you a lot of this, what does this all mean for you, why this is so important, why I get super excited about being in the marketing space and being in the digital space is, it's still the renaissance and we get to be part of this right now. If you think back to what would it would have been like to be in Venice when da Vinci was painting, that's where we are right now, and it's hard to see it sometimes because we are sitting at the epicenter of it, but the rate of innovation, the rate of change, the rate that everything is happening is faster than ever before. I think back and I laugh about my, my beeper, actually, not my mobile phone. Who could afford a mobile phone in 2002? Um, and I think about where we were then to where we are now and how much has happened in 15 years the world is gonna change in five years. How quickly companies become multi-billion dollar companies and fail. How quickly MySpace was a thing to completely not a thing in any way, shape, or form. The where the world is going and this need to constantly change and evolve is more and more important. Um, so I started to think about what are some trends that are happening today? And what are the things that I'm really excited about in the digital world? Uh, one of them is this explosion of digital technology. The, the way you used to buy advertising. Um, so a long, long time ago, once I got a reputable job, and I worked, uh, <laughs> I have reputable jobs now. It's very funny that I'm very official and very corporate. Um, and when I started at Salesforce and I was running digital there and I was telling someone about my background, they told me I shouldn't discuss it because it, I, <laughs> like, you really, you shouldn't discuss where you've come from. And I was like, work, I worked at an online trading company and in these five other industries. Um, so what's super interesting right now is this explosion of digital technology. It's not just about how you call a bunch of people to buy ads, it is about everything new that is coming out, how you can better target, how you can better evolve. Um, and something I would have never predicted is this rise of the mobile first business. There are businesses now that are billion dollar businesses that don't really have a website because they have an app on your phone. And it's not about getting people to your website and converting them, it's about getting them into your app and growing apps. And this concept of growth marketing, which I'm not gonna lie, I made fun of a little bit uh, because I'm skeptical and snarky as a reformed New Yorker. Um, this concept of growth marketing, which is this interact, intersection of digital and product. It's not just about, as a marketer, what to do to get someone to your website or to your product, is what do you do inside of your product to engage them, to get them to buy more, and it's how do you put them together. I'm in the B2B space. I love B2B. It's a lot harder of a sale. It's, you have to work with a lot of salespeople. There's no salespeople here. Sorry. Um, you have to work with a lot of salespeople, which is a challenge as a marketer, but I really enjoy it. Um, and there's <laughs> nobody, the people who work at Box don't tell Tom that. Um, so there's this whole thing of account-based marketing. So, so much of digital started to be about how do I scale, how do I grow, how do I get as many people as humanly possible to this website to go through this conversion funnel to buy my product to close. Account-based marketing is totally different. It's, how do I define who the audience is up front to get the exact person that matters? Figure out how to get in front of the exact person that matters at the time that they're thinking about buying before they're thinking about our product and move them through the funnel. So you have these breadth strategies online and then you have these super deep strategies. Um, there's this idea of predictive analytics. How do you take these different signals of what people are doing on the internet? How do you compare that to your average user today? And how do you start to predict what your next customer is, who your next customer could be before they're starting to think? There's this whole rise of data science and this field of data science. It's not mad men anymore, it's these data nerds who are coming in. I'm building um, 
uh, new targeting strategies for post-sales nurture programs right now, I have to check with my data science team to help me build segments. Data scientists and marketing functions weren't real even a few years ago. Um, I geek out on social. I was a very early adopter of social. I'll admit I completely don't understand Snapchat. Um, <laughs> there'll be someone else that'll be teaching you about that in this because I'm not that person. Um, thankfully with Gary. Uh, but never underestimate where social is, where social is going. Um, quick things on where the world is going is technology and platforms are growing really fast or evolving really, really fast. The good things to always anchor on is the importance of messaging and strategy and segmentation. Your basic marketing principles are becoming more and more important again. There's this interesting dichotomy between the account-based marketing, that highly targeted, and that high scale, and the world is still figuring out who does what when. There's not this one-size-fits-all formula, which is super, super fun. And this um, increase in AI and machine learning is starting to accelerate the rate of growth as a digital marketing function, but also what all of us need to do to be competitive, to have our businesses be competitive. Um, so what does this all mean, and major takeaways and things you need to know? Um, Oh, hang on, if I can use a computer. There we go. Digital, not technical. Um, <laughs> uh, most important thing and the thing that I need to anchor on all the time is never stop learning. The skills you have yesterday might not be relevant today. 15 years ago, 10 years ago, I was a hell of an SEO. I'm not the expert on this anymore. There's, there's people that are in the weeds and are smarter on this, even though I was technically the expert on this 10 years ago. Network as much as you can. I have learned more from a bar at an event than I have learned from a conference. Network, learn from your peers. Your peers are probably doing some really cool stuff, and you are too, and how you put those together. Um, things that will never go out of style, that are increasingly important now, are your analytical skills. Hone your analytical skills as much as possible and hone your communication skills. If you can combine analytical and communications, it doesn't matter where the world evolves to. These skills are completely transferable. The most important thing I will leave you all with is if all else fails, go back to basics. Um, the thing that I have always said to everyone that has worked for me, and I'm going to say I'm the one who invented this phrase, is um, if you don't know what you should be doing, if you don't know how you should track success, if you don't know where to go, always think about, well, what do I need to do that I can drive a beer with? If I'm in e-commerce, how do I increase sales? If I'm in the B2B side, how do I increase ARR? So always think about what are your core, what are your core marketing basics, and at the end of your day, whatever your goals are, should be something you can buy a beer with. Uh, so thank you very much. Uh, I'm Lauren. And And up next, we have Gary, who is incredibly more impressive than I am. So I will leave this to you, and I'm not going to steal this and punk oh, it. Thank you. I'll give you a shock. Okay. Um, I'll give you this back. Um, hi, everybody. Actually, I'm going to start with beer. That's probably a good place to start. Um, my career started with a beer, actually, so um, that's probably a good place to start. I want to talk about beer. I want to talk about my dad. I want to talk about... Um, social networks and kind of social networks. I'm responsible for marketing at Facebook, uh, but my career started actually with a beer. I was I was at home um, watching a baseball game, falling asleep on the couch, and my dad encouraged me to go to this fundraiser for this congressman who I'd worked for out of college. And um, this guy walked up to me, and um, I was getting a beer at a keg. And I struck up a conversation with him, and he said to me, um, what do you do? And I was trying to change jobs, going from working in government to try to get a job in marketing. And he said, I'll make you a deal if you work on my campaign. He was running for Board of Finance in our hometown. He said, if you work on my campaign, I'll get you an interview. And his best friend had a job opening as a marketing analyst at Pepsi. And two people I worked for at Pepsi ended up being early at eBay, brought me to me and my family, moved out to California to join eBay. And then on and on and on. The reason I'm telling you that is I think exactly what you were just saying is so much of this really comes down to two things, I think. Uh, maybe three if you add beer. Um, <laughs> beer is actually, I think, rather important. Um, 
One is the nature of people and the important part of people and how you kind of carry yourself and get connected with people through your career. A lot of that can be luck. Um, I'll touch back on this more toward the end. Um, and a lot of it has to do with agility. And, and agility, you know, there's a software term around agility about how people now, rather than in a serial way, uh, in a kind of concurrent, iterative way, build software. Um, but agility in terms of how you learn, how you adapt, because all of what was been said for the last set of speakers is I couldn't agree with more. What's happening is this rate of change, the rate of disruption, um, will just continue to accelerate. I know you hear that a lot, but one of the things I find that's kind of practical, if you actually think you use the reference of the iPhone being 10 years old, nearly all the companies who are actually succeeding and winning in cell phones back then are gone. Um, and the way I think about it, the way we certainly think about it in the companies where I've worked, certainly the case with Facebook right now, is we act as if we're going to go out of business. Um, and I think that's really important. And so as a result, this idea of kind of the nature of agility and going out of business gets me back to my dad. So my dad worked in advertising for about 30 years, mostly at the same firm. And at the age of 59, they lost their major account, and he had two months' notice. So 30 years, two months' notice. And my father was a company guy. I don't know how many people I'm kind of going to date myself know the book, The Man in the Gray Flannel Suit. But my dad, there you go, thank you for that. Um, my dad was of that era, which was essentially, well, he was kind of of the Mad Men era. Um, I like to say he was of that era, but not that dysfunction, um, <laughs> fortunately. And uh, in terms of his advice to me was, this is really the business that you're going to go into is about people. This is not about companies. This is about people. And so I think a big part of that is um, his other piece of advice was to be the client, but this idea to continue to learn. Now, in continuing to learning, I found myself years, a couple of years later, about 10 years later, still at, at Pepsi, um, and one of the most famous creative directors in the history of advertising, a guy named Phil Dusenberry, who did a lot of the big um, Pepsi campaigns, came to come speak about the emergence and change of technology. And this is in 1995, and he said, actually, the internet he thought would be a fad. Now, you guys have just met me, you don't really know me. I'm not that usually that kind of visceral of a person, but I remember being in the audience and thinking to myself, I gotta get myself out of this job. <laughs> I gotta go do something else. I moved into technology about two years later in, in 97 and kind of stayed in that since. But when you actually see things that are major trends and you have this kind of sense to yourself that I've actually gotta make a change, it does come down to these two points of who are the people around you. I think this idea of you know, how do you actually get a beer with, with somebody uh, based upon the knowledge you have is exactly right. And then what is the, your ability to kind of take what you know and with agility move to what's next? Now, I think the big part of what's happening um, is I, I find it actually, I find it somewhat frustrating to be honest that this is considered relatively new. The fact of the matter is, as it relates to technology, the internet, as it relates to um, Amazon, in terms of Amazon, what they're doing in their strategy, and for that matter, the consumer browser, is, dates back to 1994. So we're essentially a generation into this. And for a lot of people, the way they're thinking about it is that this is essentially disruption. That term comes up in terms of disruption. This has been coming for quite some time. And I think the thing that I think I'm trying to bring to the teams I work with and what we're trying to get to is have people really understand the impact this is having on people in society and actually get us the conviction to move much more quickly. And in terms of moving much more quickly, I think there's a set of things about what we're going to try to need from, rely on from one another as we kind of interact with people and grow as people um, in this nature of technology. With the disruption that, that has happened with um, our individual lives and how technology become more central to it, Certainly there has been this move to mobile, and that's, I think you've made great summaries of that, and we talked about that as it relates to retail and um, the changing in nature of how we think about developing products inside companies. I want to talk a little bit more about what this means for the nature of, of people. So certainly I think one of the things that we're focused on in terms of where I work is this idea of through technology, we've got to learn how to be supportive of one another. Um, and in terms of support of one another, one of the things that I think has been part of um, the internet since it started, if you go all the way back to GeoCities, maybe I'll go back to the same gentleman who know the, knew the man in the gray flannel suit, you remember GeoCities? Um, GeoCities, since we've kind of started in technology and the internet, there's been this desire to find through this technology something that I think is quite interesting, which is actually very deep humanity. How can we connect with one another in ways that are meaningful? Uh, how can we actually help to understand one another in ways that um, has deepens understanding from one another? Um, 
The, the thing that's, that's actually vital to some of this, I think, to recognize, because we're, we're very fortunate to live in a place where I think it is very much like the Renaissance, where we're in this midst of technology, is how much the world isn't this. Um, and, and a couple of data points to understand as kind of background. First of all, two-thirds of the world is actually not on the Internet. Most of the world actually does not have a 4G connection. Most of the world is on a 2G connection. And 85% of the world is within reach of a cell phone tower. So those two-thirds of people who don't have connection, nearly all of them are within reach of a cell phone tower. And the reason they're not on the Internet is usually two reasons. One is cost, simple fact of data costs, which I think we can all understand. That it, and certainly in certain markets, it's quite expensive to have a cell phone. It's much, like, much less cable TV. Um, but the other part is they're not sure why they should be on it. Now, the reason I think this is really vitally important to recognize is as you're kind of interacting and building products, you're building products for the world, and the world isn't us. But it, I think having the empathy to understand what the world actually needs as it relates to technology starts with this fundamental understanding of what position are people in and how do we actually bring people along with us. As part of that, I think the other thing that technology is start, starting to be looked at to do more is to make sure that we're safer as a community. Um, the, the reliability that we have for what's next door to us at times isn't what we want it to be. And you're seeing businesses like Nextdoor, um, certainly part of what people do with Facebook with groups, um, Instagram groups, et cetera, are rising because this is an opportunity for people to find safety and com communality with one another as we go through this major technology shift. Um, the other trend that's actually big as it relates to going beyond being supportive and safe is informed. And as a lot has been written about this in the last set of months, um, you're seeing in terms of social media, the nature of the news media, uh, as those business models continue to evolve, again, the disruption of this has been happening for quite some time. The peak employment in the U.S. in journalism, in the news media, was actually in 1993. So the, the, the shrink of, of news media and what's going on, the disruption that's been going on in our economy, actually happened with the beginning of classified ads online, which was referenced earlier, um, back in the early 90s. So this continues to evolve and accelerate. But the, the need for us and how we're going to be informed from one another, the role we're each going to play in how we inform one another, the role we actually each play in taking each other from extremes to understanding is a big trend that will continue to evolve. And I think in relation to that information, the other part is how we all become engaged. I think one of the things that's been fascinating to watch in various economies in the last year, particularly the US, is the, the extent to which people are start, starting to now feel much more engaged in the need to be civically engaged. One of the things that you're seeing happening through social media is actually connecting people more to their government officials and the information of understanding everybody who's local to everybody who's national. Almost all those people are online, have social media in some regard, some more famously than others. Um, but certainly as it relates to the connection that people are going to have with their individual elected representatives and how information flows uh, between and among elected rep um, representatives and their constituents will continue to evolve. Um, and I think the last point which gets to this point of how we're all not yet connected in the world is this idea of diversity, inclusion, inclusiveness, and belonging. I think one of the things that I think is the hope of, of what's trying to be going on in social media and broadly in technology is this general sense of optimism. That as this continues to evolve, as we can kind of continue to have the role we actually play for one another uh, through social media and through the ability to connect information to one another, that'll lead to a society that's more understanding um, and belonging for one another. Now, the last thing I want to say gets back to the point of people, which is I've always felt that um, if you actually do good work for good people, it actually works. I remember actually talking about somebody on one of our teams who was complaining time and time again about the project they were on and weren't quite satisfied with the projects they were on. And I actually said to them quite simply, if you do good work for good people, it largely takes care of itself. But a lot of that has to do with your ability and the ability over time to, to be, find yourself in positions where you can find good people to work with um, and hold them accountable to that. And if not, have the agility in your own career, have your agility with your own skill set to either make a move, improve uh, the surroundings that you're in at any, any given time, um, and so you can actually continue to grow. Um, and as it relates to the kind of role of technology, one of the things I want to kind of leave you with is I've certainly found that the more I've been investing myself and the people that are around me into really understanding deeply how does technology work, um, making sure I understand how the products work, 
making I understand, I understand both the math, the science, and the art, um, whether it be design or the analytics. That breadth of skill set is pretty uh, central. And as we all become more involved in technology, the importance of deepening our skill set in those areas, I think, allows us the ability to thrive in the economies to come. So with that, I want to kind of move it on. Steve um, Cadigan, who's one of the co-founders of ISD and uh, runs a digital transformation practice, is going to finish up. Thank you. time out to join us tonight. And uh, as uh, Amir mentioned, you know, we're on this digital journey together. And when I think about the digital journey, one of the things that's frustrating to me is when I think about what does it mean to me, what does it mean to my family, what does it mean to my kids, what does it mean to the, the people that I know, is that the picture that's being painted is very impersonal. It's very robot, artificial intelligence, internet of things. So, and, and I think we've not done a good job of showing people that this future that's in front of us, this digital future, is actually more human and more rich than what we've, what we've experienced. And so I've led a, about a 30-year career in the talent space, working in human resources, and I just wanted to share with you some insights I've got around where I think the future of work is going, where I think the future of jobs is going, and that all ties into why are we here and why does ISD matter? And then we're going to break for, uh, for a panel discussion after that. Couple things I'm seeing out there right now. Actually, I was driving here listening to NPR and Kai Rizdal, who I get a kick out of. And Kai Rizdal said, he, he listed this statistic which was kind of interesting. He said, today we just hit a mark where more companies were dying than were starting today. And since 2009, after the, the crash, the, the banking fiasco, more and more companies were being created than were dying. And now we just hit the inflection point and more companies were dying. So I'm like, oh great, we've got more gloom and doom, more things are awful out there, people are gonna lose their jobs. And what I'm seeing when I'm going out there talking to people in executives and companies or people who are looking for work is that people are definitely staying in jobs longer. So let me take the poll that I always like to take when I'm in front of a group. Is anyone here in an organization where people are staying longer this year than they were two or three years ago? Okay, one hand. He's our PR firm back there. Nice job, Trey. <laughs> um, so that's interesting, right? McKinsey published a study that said, by the age of 40, most millennials will have had, wait for it, 11 different jobs. And if you do the math on that, it's about every two years, people are gonna be changing. So when I'm hearing about Macy's closing stores, when I'm hearing Microsoft's laying off 5,000 people, when I'm hearing Jawbone just went belly up, and I'm hearing all these stories about all the change of technology and, and how fast businesses are coming and going. I'm asking myself, are companies really being built to last for 100 years right now? Is that what they're doing? Are they being built to thrive right now? It's interesting, right? And when you think about your career and what the implications are for an organization, if I don't know what the future holds and I don't know whether I'm gonna have my paradigm disrupted in my business, as, as you, know, you just heard, you know, act as if you may be going out of business, right? I mean. Think about what, what does that mean if you're an organization and you're not really sure what the future holds, what are your people thinking about their future in your organization? And so millennials, and I think the generation of workers right now, people are staying less and they're changing jobs and how they're looking at work is also changing. More and more people are moving to a sort of a temp or a contractor ca capacity and people are less loyal to a company necessarily than they are to worker projects. Tell you a quick story, I was at LinkedIn a few years ago, got a phone call. Steve, we had an employee quit today. Okay, why are you calling me, that happens. Uh, it was their first day. <laughs> their first day, they quit? Did someone hit them in the parking lot on the way to orientation? Like, what happened? Um, so I said, listen, I wanna talk to that person tomorrow. I was like, well, I don't know if we can get them to come in, they wanna quit right now. I said, no, let me come talk to them. So I talked to this person. I said, Hitesh was his name, Hitesh. Um, so, and I'd been recruiting Hitesh for months, okay? Very, very uh, critical hire for us. Hitesh, I understand you just gave your notice after orientation. <laughs> um, what, you know, what happened? Oh, Steve, I gotta tell you. When I was interviewing with you, I was also interviewing with a couple of other companies. One of them was Facebook, and they had this project that I was really interested in doing. 
but they had to shut the project down in the course of the interview process, and so I decided to work for you. It wasn't my first choice, the Facebook opportunity was, but then after I accepted the job, they called me and said, guess what, we've just greenlit that project, it's back on, would you like to come? And my inner East Coast godfather voice started like, you're so dead to me right now, I was so frustrated. <laughs> I've been whining and dining and courting this person. I mean, it is tough recruiting here in the Valley for software talent. And he said, no, no, I want to do that work. No apology, no regret. And I was like, wow. And so I thought, is this a canary in the coal mine or is this an exception? And he's like, no, I talked to my parents, my friends. Yeah, they think it's a good idea. I should go do that because that's, that's the work I want to do. I was like, wow, okay. I did change the name, so you know, to protect the innocent on that one. Um, but I think we're headed to this world which actually is way more human and way more exciting from a career point of view. And I know it's scary and frustrating because a lot of us think, oh, I was built to think about a career as a long, like 15, 20 years, I gotta be loyal to a company for a long period of time, and I've gotta build this linear path. That's changing, I think, now. We're seeing how fast more industries are dying faster today, not just companies than ever before. And so I think we're all needing to build a greater, as you've heard it today, the words agile, resiliency, capacity to learn and grow. And I think we're gonna start to see people look at work as a series of adventures, not necessarily a long career or a long job. And something's really interesting that's driving this in addition to people's framing differently how they think about work. Value is being created by many or more organizations today outside the company than inside. I want you to work with me for a second. Think about the traditional company creates intellectual property, they put something together. I'm, I've come from a semiconductor uh, background, and, and you know, you're, take, you're talking about three, five, seven year development cycles to build this chip. You design it, you sell it, you build it, you test it, you implement it, and then you actually uh, receive some revenue from the customer. That's your intellectual property. Today, we have a proliferation of new platforms where the value created, the value that's actually being delivered is created outside the company. By, and, and so that's a really interesting shift that has implications, I think, for a lot of people. But think about all these brands that you see up here. What a Airbnb is providing you is a platform so that someone else's house is made available to you. They didn't build that house in that company, but they've made it available to you. And so as an individual in this new universe of opportunity, what's great about this new platform and the fact that value is being created outside is that all of us can develop revenue in many other ways than just having a job. I can loan my car out when I'm not using it. I could become a taxi driver for a weekend if I want to. I can produce some music and sell it. My kids the other day, I come home uh, from work and my son's watching YouTube, as he does. And so my first instinct was, did I put the parental filter on the YouTube? And then after I remembered that I'd done that, I said, what are you watching? He goes, Dad, check this out. This guy goes to baseball parks every day, and he's got a YouTube channel, and he's got 500,000 followers, and all he does is analyze the data around where the foul balls are gonna go, and he gets a ticket there, and he gets the foul ball, and he films it, and he shows his friends. And I knew what was coming next. I want to do that, right? <laughs> and I was like, well, so the next question is the responsible parent is, well, how, how much money is he, is he making from, from YouTube on this? Oh, he's making a lot of money, Dad. Look at the car he drives. Look at how the seats he's got. Look at how many balls he gets. So uh, tangential story connected to that story. We, were, we went to a Giants game a few weeks ago, and they actually did win this one. But um, <laughs> Dad, we got to get there two hours before. And his brother, Trevor... My older son, Connor, is 13. His brother, Trevor, was going to be videoing Connor chasing the foul balls. Like, they're already, like, he's, and his, and Trevor's twin brother, Spencer, was going to try to orchestrate, like, okay, we're going to capture this. We're going to try to see if we can figure it out. Um, but how fascinating is that, that they saw on YouTube how value is being created, and they're thinking about how this is going to, very differently about work and income and, and how that's going to affect their lives. And there are so many more that I uh, could have put up here. But think about that. Value creation outside the company rather than inside the company. I think it, it makes us think differently about work, too, when you think about that. Um, something also that I'm seeing happening right now as part of this is that uh, employees 
are becoming uh, value creators. And I know what you're thinking, right? You're like, I always wanted to become a VC until recently when it didn't become so cool to be in the uh, VC community. But employees are going to become not seen as like workers, but value creators because you can generate value in so many different ways than you could before. And we used to invest all this time around becoming deeply, deeply technical and experienced in certain disciplines. And I think in the future, you're going to want to invest in becoming versatile and agile and becoming the most uh, you know, highly adaptive person in your organization. Where you can, when, the, when the winds change, and they will change in your industry, you want to be the person that the company says, yes, I want you to help me, and I want you to uh, help us grow the organization. So jobs as we knew them, eh, I think it's done. You want me to go back? Did you get that photo? No? Okay. All right. Um, and I think that the great news for all of us is that this is going to give us a lot more freedom, a lot more choice. I want you to hear that for, and have it resonate because so much of what the rhetoric is, it's about job lost. The, these you know, robots are going to take over the world and you don't have a job. And I think it's really frustrating people. And we've got to recognize, and I think this is a lot of what's behind ISD Digital University, is that we want to help build a, a, a workforce that sees so much more opportunity of making the world a lot more human. And because I think, and we may even need a better language. And because when I hear the word digital, I think of zeros and ones, and I think of cold, impersonal. And actually, the digital future is a lot more human and a lot more real than we've had before. So we're going to have a lot more choice. Careers are not going to be linear anymore. We're going to have the ability to uh, have many new adventures uh, and string them together. And uh, as you heard Lauren say, I mean, your network vitality is your currency in the future. It's not just, I'm not talking about schmoozing. I'm not talking about, hey, wasn't the, weren't those cookies really good at that ISD talk? And you know, I'm talking about the fact that organizations today, when they're recruiting, and I'm talking to all the companies here because all my friends are recruiting in the Valley right now, they're measuring the quality of your network when they're considering you to join their organization. Because they know you're going to hit a problem that you're not sure you've faced before and you're not sure how to solve it, but do you know someone who can help you solve it? Do you know someone that could help you think through something differently? And so this is really, really important. So I was talking to someone the other day about this. I said, well, I just out of school, Steve, I don't have a network. Did you have teachers in school? Yeah. Did you work in summer camp? Yeah. Do you have counselors? Yeah. Do your parents have friends? Yeah. Okay. You got a network. You know so many more people than you think you do. But that is so important in an uncertain future, is having people that you can lean on to provide new opportunities to you. I also think that uh, the CV, the resume, the LinkedIn profile is going to change dramatically in the future. I think it's going to be like uh, the IMDB model. You guys familiar with what that is? So basically, in the entertainment industry, uh, there's a database that says you worked on this movie, you did this lighting feature, this is, and, and you can track the metrics on how successful that movie was, and you can actually measure what people are working on very specifically. I gave a, a talk recently on the future of leadership, and one of the things that I also think we're going to see in the very near future is just as you finish uh, a ride on Lyft, for example, you get out and you get sent, you get pushed to notice, or, or whether it's Uber, you get pushed to notice, how was the quality of your driver? All you leaders who manage people today, get ready for it. Your employees are going to get pushed pretty soon. How effective was that meeting that you had with your manager? How, how effective is the quality of their coaching, career guidance? That's going to be a big part. The transparency that we're already seeing right now is going to proliferate. I talked to an organization yesterday, an entrepreneur in Spain who's starting a company, and what he wants to do is come up with a ubiquitous model for assessing leaders that can be shared. Um, and ultimately, I'm seeing a lot more of that. Um, career, the future of careers is bright. It's not scary. Uh, Amir and I talk a lot about the travel industry. Let's talk about the travel industry just for a second. What happened when online booking came to all the travel agents in the world? Many of them lost their jobs. But how many thousands and thousands of new opportunities came after that? With whether it was the Priceline.com or the Travelocity or the Expedia or the Airbnb or and on and on and on, right? So many new opportunities. Now, those weren't necessarily taken up by the travel agents who were displaced. But you could argue if a wave of technology is coming in, there are massive amounts of new opportunities that we don't even know are there. And that's what, we, that's what we're all about at ISD. 
Um, and so when I think about the future, it really is about helping people become more versatile and adaptive. That's where I think we're going to see people want to invest more. I was asked by a university recently, San Jose State, to give some thoughts around how they could be more relevant to companies in Silicon Valley, how they could be more relevant for their students. And I said, I'm, I'm worried less about a specific curriculum. I'm worried more about people who can work in a frenetic, chaotic, ever-changing environment. Can you do something about how you teach to deliver students to me that are used to that, who like and love moving around, who have a growth mindset? That's, I think, what the future is. Um, and so the future is not a robot, <laughs> my final words. So thank you very much. I hope what you've had, see, and you saw the iteration, you know, PowerPoint, no PowerPoint, PowerPoint, no PowerPoint, closing with the PowerPoint. Did you like the PowerPoint? Okay, good. Um, but thank you guys very much. I'd like to invite the rest of the board up here to take some questions. All right. Pretty cool, huh? You like? Oh, awesome. So I, um, you know, what, one of the things, God, we thought there, there's a big line in the bathroom right now, so don't go away. <laughs> uh, it's not that big, you guys. I, um, it was funny because Gary had to go earlier, and I chased him down because he had his mic on, and I said, Gary, I've been there before. Don't do it. <laughs> so it's so, like a Jim, that was a Jim Carrey moment, I think, yeah. if I remember the movie correctly. Yeah. So, so while we're waiting for them, I, I, I want you to think about this, and I don't want you to say anything out loud. You can just think about this and tell me. But... Are you afraid? Are you afraid? No. Are you excited? You know? I mean, if you look at what's, ha what's happening and all the different things that are happening in the world, I, I you know, you, you can, it's really up to us that, as to how we want to tackle this. And, and we're really excited. And, you know, we'll, I, you know one, one of the things we want to do at the end is talk a little bit about ISD, just like one minute. But actually, we can do it now while the people are in the bathroom if you want. <laughs> but I, uh, you know, the, the idea, not just with ISD, but all of these alternative education type approaches that are there today, is that your baseline fundamental education that you received going through college, you have to figure out how to keep current. So take advantage of what's out there and, and, and do those things. And, you know, ISD is going to be right for some people. There's other programs that are going to be right for others. But, but understand what's happening because everything that we're talking about, as soon as you learn something, it becomes much more simple, right? And right now, when you don't know something, you remember when you didn't know how to use a phone. I mean, I remember people that would not, I'll never own a cell phone. I will never. My landline. How many people have a landline, you know? I still get, you know, um, you know, what for having, getting the newspaper, because my wife and I like to do the crossword puzzle. But, but jokingly, um, uh, Jimmy Fallon always says that that's where you know where all the old people live, is where they still have newspapers on the ground. Right, right, yeah. So, um, so thank you for uh, turning in your questions. Um, I, the, the first one's actually for Greg. And, and Greg, the question is, in the next five years, what are you most concerned about, and what are you most excited about? Ooh, that's a, that's a good question. Um, you know, I think, you know, I, I think there is uh, some anxiety around uh, this in the political spectrum. And, you know, I've, um, uh, Gary talked a little bit about that. And, um, and, and you as well um, talked about how uh, the perception that uh, some of these changes um, are only played out as negative consequences all the time may um, color the conversation and may um, force um, politicians to make some poor decisions in terms of um, how they get deployed. And, and, and we may get some regulatory frameworks that um, make it harder for some of these things to actually happen. Um, and the converse of that is I actually think that uh, this notion of building a more human experience is actually the direction that we're going towards. We're, we're moving towards more mediated experiences. People want to spend time together and be face to face, and and not have technology disintermediate dis them from their lives as much as we spend time on our devices. And uh, a lot of the work that's happening right now is around um, simplifying the basic necessity items of our lives. And we're actually, I, I think, I'm very optimistic that we're actually going to have more free time. Uh, in our lives to do more creative pursuits inside of work and outside of work. 
And I'm really enthusiastic about that because I think if we become a planet of creatives, it would be really awesome. <laughs> Absolutely. I, um, a couple of things about Greg, by the way. Greg um, actually was uh, at, in design at SAP and actually started App House uh, for SAP, which is now uh, kind of turned into a little bit of Hana House and, and that whole uh, platform. He was also chief experiential officer at GE and uh, one of the primary uh, folks that drove the Internet of Things um, uh, and that whole platform there. And he's currently running Google Cloud um, interface and, and, and design and so on. And he is going to be running our, our, our design module. So I did a very poor job of introducing him <laughs> earlier. And just want to make sure that you know who he is. So the oh, next. Just one other thing. I've had like 11 careers so far. <laughs> 11 <laughs> careers, yeah. <laughs> But well, our, my, my favorite moment with Greg was actually driving Good up to uh, <laughs> Stockton to take our board boys uh, airsoft extreming. So that was really fun to, to talk all the way up there. Uh, Kyle went. And, Kyle and boys, Kyle yeah. <laughs> so the next question is for Jenny. And, and the question is, do you consider the popularity of peer-to-peer -peer sales, i.e. Poshmark, LetGo, and so on, a threat to traditional and even online retail? Uh, I, could, I could tell you that... Um, you know, there's so much going on, that's the last thing we're thinking about being a competition. But personally, I actually love those um, platform. I think it's great to be able to recycle what you have and share and the community of that. Uh, I myself actually wearing today, you know, something from Real Real, if you know what that platform is. Um, so I think it is definitely growing. Um, and there, as we all know, we all have a closet full a room full of clothes and how do you get rid of it and is really by recycling it. Um, so I think it's gonna keep growing, but I certainly don't think that is at this point is the, you know, is the focus of competition. But I, one thing I learned in retail, never say never. So, so I have a follow on question for you. Jenny, in addition, so, so by the way, Jenny was a gap, started Old Navy with a group of executives and was president of Old Navy and then um, became uh, president and CEO of Charlotte Roos. She's also on the board of Levi. And one of the things I don't understand is why is it that you're talking about all this change and everything else, but when you go to the Levi store, it's still 509s. And all they do is Lines. they change the number of buttons or 501s or whatever, right? <laughs> it's the same exact thing. So how do you, <laughs> so why, how do they do well? Well, first of all, you know, you might not know this, but the 501 has, there's, of course, the original 501, but there's many iteration of 501s. So, um, and certain things are left alone because of the authenticity of that product, and 501 is one of those things. Um, and, but, you know, you keep tweaking it, and you might not know that it's changed. If you ever pull out something in your closet that you love and love for many, many years, and 20 years and then you put it on and even though it's back in trend, but it still doesn't look the same. Because like your red leather pan, if you put it on, <laughs> even though maybe it's back in style, You're it's not gonna look the same. Yeah. Uh, so, so the tweaking of, of, of something is very necessary uh, and you might not even know it's changed. And uh, the 501 is one of those items. Okay. Uh, so it's a it's so perfect to begin with why would you want to fuss with it why would you bedazzle it why would you even do that exactly yeah. <laughs> exactly <laughs> why would you bedazzle i think is the, the general point. general <laughs> point yeah that's my general point just okay. remember it was very very popular <laughs> <laughs> to bedazzle something bedazzle so so the next question is for lauren um this is like the dating game. Um, <laughs> if you could go back five years, <laughs> what skill do you wish you would have learned? Uh, so many. Um, I think a lot now, even on my end, on what are the, the gaps that I have? What are the things that I wish I knew five years ago? Uh, one big piece of it is um, on the SaaS side. So I've been in SaaS. Uh, I've been in California almost 10 years, so I've been in the SaaS world for nine. I'm only just starting to care about post-sales experience and what happens to the customer and not just after they buy, what do you do and how do you get them to use the product and what is the entire process and how do you go deeper with adoption and upsell and really adding value. I am now just really spending time and digging into that and it's completely changed how I think about acquisition and marketing. I wish I would have known that five years ago and had the desire to think through that a little bit more five years ago. 
it would have exposed weaknesses I didn't know I had until now. Um, and the other thing, honestly, is Spanish. Um, I just, I'm tired of being an American that only speaks English. And uh, when is the best time to learn a language? Yesterday. I When's the you. second best time to learn a language? Now. Yeah. Um, so if I can go back in time five years, if you guys can help me pick that up. <laughs> that would be great. <laughs> okay, very good. So I'm gonna start with Gary on this one, but I mm -hmm. want the rest um, of right. the folks I'm to also think about this. Gary. Oh, you're mic'd up. I'm mic'd so up. the first, so the question for you, the but also for before. the rest of you. So think about this. This is homework for everyone. <laughs> I don't even hear what you said. Keep going, man. You're good. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> the number one skill you think people need today. Um, yeah, I, actually, you, you mentioned this one before, so I was thinking of. Uh, I'd say distillation, and um, what I mean by distillation, I was kind of thinking of. I, I wanted to say analytics, and then I also wanted to say uh, writing and communications. But I think both of them actually come down to distillation. Um, on the analytics side, the reason I say that is, is I don't think you have to understand like to under the core data science point necessarily, which you're gonna go into that as a career. But the ability to take lots of data and synthesize it and know which data is real. I mean, there's tons of data inside organizations, but actually knowing what data is actually real. What are the metrics you ought to care about when you actually get the data? Is it legit? Um, being able to smell when something is actually just off. Um, and so distillation from the analytics side is, is critically important. And you know, like at Facebook, we run the brand essentially on kind of five metrics. But figuring out what were those five metrics to get to was a lot of work in that is distillation. And I think the other point, and actually I'll, I'll plug a book that actually, it's actually kind of like a textbookish thing that I was, thought was quite important. There's a woman named Barbara Minto who wrote this book called The Pyramid Principle. It essentially is how to take lots of words and concepts and things like that and be able to distill them down into something that's easily presented. So the other point I think is really important because the amount of information, the amount of the pace at which things are going in a, in, in a company. Um, I had some earlier time in my career, I was in McKinsey for a set of years. The biggest thing I got out of that McKinsey was actually two things. One is I married my wife who, who was a client and asked me out. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, believe, believe me, I needed it. Um, <laughs> and uh, and What's that? Oh, totally, totally. If you, if, if you met her, a couple of people out here know, know her, if you knew her, sure. Um, and the other was the ability to take lots of conceptual stuff and break it down into something I can present very, very quickly. Um, and I think the idea of kind of distillation on both sides of the brain is pretty important. Very good. Oh, that's my mic. Oopsie. Sorry, someone else? Yeah, I just echo, um, you know, in the design thinking world, we use the same term, but it's uh, synthesis, right? Yeah. It's synthesizing um, constructs into actionable insights, things which you can act on that you know as an organization you're capable of moving forward with and that are meaningful to your customer in some important way. And, um, and then the other thing I would say added to that is become a great storyteller because um, you have to distill and then you have to have a narrative and then the narrative is how you make things happen in organizations or with customers or with people. Both of those are great. Um, you know, to add on, I would say, um, I think you and I chatted a little bit about it, is really continuous learning. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, I, I truly mean this. I feel like I've been in retail for over 30 years. I was telling somebody, I, I think I know less today than I knew five, 10 years ago. And, and because of the ever-changing and the, I think the learning also comes with an incredible sense of curiosity. Wanting to, to really find out and not be afraid we keep using the word not being afraid. And um, especially in fashion retailing, it's all about taking risk, calculated risk. So. And then um, to echo a lot of that in the, the distillation piece, um, I think the flip side of it is also translation. Is the, I'll give you an example. The, I have an incredibly talented CEO and who is very involved and really enjoy working for him. And he'll come and he'll ask for something very specific. What you have to know so much now is not necessarily what someone's technically asking you for, but what are they really asking you for? And how do you start to translate from that of, I want you to do X. Well, have that curious mindset. Why do you want me to do X? What problem are you really trying to solve? And really learning how to translate what your boss is asking you to do versus what they really want. Translating what the customer is saying, I want this, 
no, 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 what do you, that might be what you want, but what problem do you really have? And how do I make sure I translate what you think you want to what you actually want, whether it's a coworker, a manager, or a customer? I don't think I can add much other than just maybe reframing what, uh, um, what you guys were saying, which is trying to find the signal and the noise, because mm -hmm. we live in really noisy universes. And I also think from a career perspective in answering that question is um, what you really want to invest in and what you're really tempted not to invest in is you want to invest in building trust. Trust is so powerful. Some people think hard work gets you ahead. Hard work does get you ahead. Trust gets you further. And trust can be obtained through hard work. But the goal is not always hard work. The goal is trust. And if we're looking at a device more than we're looking at another human being, I think is you're going to be challenged in their capability of building trust. So investing the time in building authentic relationships, super important, as we have all this noisy distraction around us. So while, while we're with you, Steve, this question's for you, and then we can come back with the wave, if that's OK. Mm -hmm. uh, with change and individual transformation, uh, what do you look for in hiring now compared to five years ago? Is there something that doesn't matter anymore? I look for people who've been in pretty crazy situations. That um, That's really important to me that they, they've been able to demonstrate that they can work in a very frenetic, very fast-paced, uh, changing organization, and they can bring some sense and some ability to build. Because a lot of us are building now. My whole career prior to going to a private pre-IPO company was fixing and tuning what other people had done before me. And when I was in finally in a sort of a 400-person company at LinkedIn, and we were just growing like crazy, learning how to build and operate in, in situations that were constantly changing was very, very hard and super important. And I think being able to scale um, is really critical today. Gary? What matters less, as you said, what matters? What so matters? When, you, when you're hiring, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, what do you look for in hiring now? Yeah, um, um, okay. Compared well, to five years ago. Um, boy, I, I think, we touched on some of the themes, so I'll be pretty quick. I, I think I, I'm concerned less in terms of somebody jumping around in jobs and more the sense of have they taken something really complex and made it and, and made something out of it. I think this idea, you said it really well, this idea of being able to um, synthesize, simplify, focus um, from the, the getting the signal out of the noise is, is exactly right. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I would say, um, just to build on that, comfortable with ambiguity. Uh, willing to surf through it. Um, some people really struggle with that. And uh, a lot of our environment right now um, requires you to enter ambiguity to actually find the answer. And then, um, then you also have to learn how to distill it and execute on it and focus on it. So um, I'm always asking for, I always ask the same sets of questions to people. Um, tell me about a project that you went into that you had no understanding of how to solve and what did you do? What did you do next? How did you make it successful? What were the, you know, what were the things that you did along the way that allowed you to uh, socialize that with stakeholders? How did you get to a point where you knew that there was an outcome that was of value? And then I ask the same sets of questions over and over and over again, you know, through their career. And if I find that there's someone who's been able to sort of wrangle that and then make sense of it, then I'm like, okay, that's great. Let's pull this person in. Um. I would say probably, you know, since retail is such, especially apparel retail is such a tough in industry today, I really look for someone that really truly have a passion for fashion and apparel. I mean, you have to be really crazy to be in this business right now. <laughs> so you have to really truly love clothes. I know it sounds so simple, um, but if you don't love that, you shouldn't really be doing it. Um, and and um, that's kind of, I would say, I start there first. Of course, then it builds up from there. I think the thing I've always looked for is hustle. And it's the, I'll never care if you went to Stanford, I care if you have that hustle, that sort of drive and that hunger. And something that I think more about now than I ever did is just a sense of open-mindedness. Uh, the sort of beginner's mindset of even if you've been doing something forever, the world's changing. Are you able to approach a situation not with the I know it all attitude, but I'm here to be open and to learn? And then um, to echo your point earlier, thinking through, and I, there's two questions that I ask every single interview. So um, this is a precursor if any of you ever work with me. Um, 
But I asked the same two questions in every interview, which always seem like softball questions, but honestly are probably the most important answers I can get from you. And it's the, uh, if you were, if you were going to give a TED talk, what would it be? Because what I want to know is, tell me you're passionate about something. I don't care what it is. I don't care if your answer is crafting. Like, be passionate. If you can't care about something, you're how am I going to get you to care about the job that I pay you for if you can't care about your, your passion in life? And then tell me your worst travel story because I need to understand how you deal with uncomfortable situations, how you deal with crisis, and what do you consider worse? If you're going to say, well, you know what? My seat didn't recline, and that's your worst <laughs> travel story, I'm sorry. There's way worse things that can happen in life. I can't deal with this. <laughs> um, and did you panic? Did you freak out? Or did you say, you know what? I had no, long I had no luggage. I had no place to stay, and I had no money. But I figured it out. Because you need that. I figured it out. Um, also, now uh, you guys all have the answers. I can, can I come back to so just because I think this is this is an awesome question. I think one of the things that gets to maybe why some folks are here, and certainly as people think about how to maybe repot themselves at, at times, um, I think people, you know, find themselves in positions where they sell themselves short in terms of I didn't get that job or I didn't go to that company and somebody else went to that company. I'm competing with somebody else who went to that company. I think one of the reasons that, that the way you've kind of articulated this is so right, Chris Cox, who runs product at Facebook, who's one of my bosses, asks a similar question. He, in an interview, he asks, what's the one thing you know more about than anybody else, and why do you know that? Mm -hmm. And that has nothing to do with where you work. It has to do with what makes you go. Um, and I think the more you give yourself credit for that and use that as a way to tell your story, we talked about that, different folks talked about that on stage, You're like, what's your story and what's the story you bring to, to your work? What's the story you bring to others, to other people? I think that is a really good central way to think about it. So, so along those lines then, if, when I look at resumes now, it used to be in the old days you look at a resume, yeah. and if somebody wasn't somewhere, you know, if they had more than two or three jobs, like, oh my God, short timer or whatever, right? Yeah. Now you look and it's every two years people are somewhere else, right? And I mean, for in the old days it would be, oh my God, that's no, no way I'm hiring this person. Today, it's a very, very different story, right? So what do you... I mean, I, when you think about that and when you're thinking about all, all this, how, how do you look at that today? Is that a good thing or a bad thing? I, I just have an example. I, I, um, uh, a former colleague of mine at SAP had been there 16 years, and uh, I was introducing her to uh, some folks inside of Google, and they were like, well, she's been there 16 years. <laughs> Well, and, and it, was, it was like a negative, and I'm like, we're you, hiring some people who are 16 at Facebook right now. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. And, and 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 I was like, you have no idea of her, you know, her journey and what she's done and how awesome she is, and she's perfect for us. Um, and um, and she's going to come here and she's going to stay for 16 more. You know, you, it's not a bad gig. Um, so I think that, that there's a notion about that that we have this kind of flip um, thing. Um, the other thing that I think um, I'm always looking for is intention. Like, I'm looking for people who are really intentional, whatever it is, right? So that they have something that um, they are, they, they find focus in and uh, they want to know, they ask themselves questions like, how can I get better at this? And, uh, and, and you can never answer that question because the answer is different every day. And if, if you can have questions, if you find people on your staff who are like that, it's great because um, you can incentivize them towards projects and programs um, if you know how they work and that they're wired that way. And so I think, you know, I'm always looking for folks that, um, you know, there's some intentionality in terms of the, how they operate. And I think that's actually the interesting thing about the world that we're entering into right now. You get this toolkit of all these crazy skills and then you bring your flavor to it and um, you ought to be successful in that. You know, I think the... If if one environment doesn't work for you, it's not your, it's not it's not because you're not great. It's just because it was the wrong environment for you to be successful in, and um, and that's something that I you know I often find myself coaching even people on my own team who outgrow a role and we don't have a role for them. I'm the first one to kick them out of the company, and 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 but I'll find them a great job somewhere else with someone I know in my network because it's like okay we you know you need to go because you're not going to be happy. You don't know it yet, but you're not going to be happy. So, no, That's very good. There's so much stuff that we can talk about on this one. I want to shift a little bit because this is kind of related, and 
would like to start with the ladies on this one, but I, everybody feel free to, uh, to, uh, to answer this, but how can women who often wait until they have all the skills shift, shift to an adventure career path? You need someone else to kick in the ass. <laughs> um, no, it's a, it's a really interesting question, and it's the, I'm assuming everybody knows this, it's women don't apply for a job unless they feel like they have 100% of the skills, where men apply for a job if they feel like they have 60% of the skills. And it's a hard thing to, to overcome, and I um, read a Facebook post today that was um, someone going to play uh, soccer with their son and their daughter. And there was a bunch of kids on a soccer field, and all the boys went out, and the son went out and played. And the daughter said, you know, I'm, I'm, I don't want to go. They're like, why? Why don't you want to go play soccer? She's like, because I'm going to be the only, the only girl. No one's asked me to go play. And her mom was like, honey, get your ass out there and go play. You can do this. And it, for that, it really echoes for me. It's the, the power of the network, the power of mentorship, and that confidence and permission to go and to do it and I will tell you I'm great at helping other people negotiate for their own salaries and reminding them that they should go and aspire for more. What I am terrible at is negotiating my own salary and pushing myself to do that which is why I will have a network of people that will literally say oh you never accept the first offer. You go back and you ask for 20% more because women get paid less which is the exact thing that I said when I negotiated my offer at Box. Uh, <laughs> um, I could share probably my own personal story. Uh, as you know, I um, was a, a founding member at O'Navy, and um, I remember, you know, three, four years into it, my boss, who is Mickey Drexler at that time, of the CEO of Gap Inc., asked me would I want to be the president of O'Navy, and I'm like, oh, no, of course not. I have great job. I'm the EVP. I have in product. And I actually turned down that job because I just thought I have, I'm so comfortable. I'm doing well. And um, then, of course, he was bringing people in, interviewing for the job. And every time he brought somebody in, I'm like, bummer, <laughs> this is my new boss. Yeah. <laughs> and a year later, it took me a year. And I sat in his office and I said, you know, he talked to me about being president. Actually, I think I want that job now. And he started laughing. He said, well, it's about time. It took you long enough to ask for it. Um, you know, I thought about it. And the other three guys were my partners, were EVP. And, you know, one had Prada, one had the field, one had finance. And, um, and of course, I said, you know, only if the other three of them think I should be the president. And he started laughing. Only you would ask that question. I would ask exactly. the exact same question. Because I, want, I said... I said, because, you know, we started the business together, and I just want to make sure they're okay with that. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, now that I'm going to be their boss versus the peer. And, of course, all three of them said, of course, you deserve to be the president. But I thought a lot about it afterward. Would any of them would do the same? Probably not. <laughs> so I think we do sell ourselves short. It took me way too long to really uh, ask for that job. Um, you know, I just think that's something that I talk about is because I really want to make sure that, you know, as women, we shouldn't do that because we really, m more often than not, are more ready for that, those positions. And then I have one, one quick anecdote for that. <laughs> this is clearly a, a sense of job for both of us. Um, I have a, a friend of mine, and I'm going to tell her story, um, at another company that is focused a lot on diversity and inclusion and has a surge program to get, uh, to increase uh, diversity in senior leadership meetings. And one of the things that happens with this is they wanted to get 30% of people in senior meetings to be, uh, to be women. So it means if the standard is getting in as an EVP, to get to that 30% number, sometimes they'd have to invite someone that was a VP or a director. What that could mean is her boss might not get invited to this meeting, but she will. So when they started doing this, a lot of the women were going up saying, are you sure I should be going? I'm really uncomfortable because my boss isn't going and I'm, I don't know, I'm gonna sit out mm. of this. And then my friend who's very senior at that company goes, do you see that guy who he's going in through the search program? Do you know what he asked me when we invited him and not his boss? She's like, what? So I need a vegan meal and am I, am I flying business to this and where's my room? Cause I'm not gonna be near the elevator. She's like, 
That's what he asked me. He didn't ask me for permission to be here. He asked for a special meal and the right trip and the right room. You just asked me if you were allowed to go. You need to start thinking like that because you deserve to be here as much as everybody else. I'll just grab one thing. Um, so when I started at GE, um, it was my first day, and uh, Beth Comstock, who at the time was a CMO and is now uh, vice, chair. vice chair of the company, um, was my new boss. And, and, and I walked in, and, and I, I said, you know, Beth, um, how should I approach this job? And, and she said, you should approach it that we want to fire you every day. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and I was like... And, and I go, why? And she goes, works for me. <laughs> and, and, and so, you know, um, I think part of it is finding mentors. Um, and she's an amazing person. She gives back so much to uh, the business community as a whole. But I think, um, uh, I, th I think for all of us, we actually have to get over ourselves and um, focus on being intentional and, 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 and learning that... Uh, the environment you place yourself in will either work out for you or not. It's not really about you or the company. It's that those two things may or may not work. So not just bring your full self to work. And um, you know, in, in obviously in the valley right now, there's a huge conversation around how does that work for minorities and for women and you know underrepresented populations in our workforces. But uh, to the extent that you can find a mentor network, it really really helps and. Um, I think we should definitely find ways to also celebrate people who are out there who are really doing things like Beth did. Hey, any final, th anything else? We're going to try to wrap up in the next minute or two. Any comments on that? Yeah, well, my other boss at Facebook is Cheryl Sandberg, um, who, who um, wrote Lean In and, and talks about it. One of the things, uh, quotes she talks about sometimes is, is uh, uh, well, two things. One is I, I think it's wonderful that we're talking about this the way we're talking about it. Clearly, look, if you look at some of the press in the Valley in the last set of weeks, there just needs to be more of this conversation. I think people need to feel um, uh, the, the ability to be really open and, 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 th and thoughtful. Um, I, Madeline Albright has this uh, quote, which I really like, which is, there's a special place in hell for women who don't help other women. Um, <laughs> and I would probably add there's a special place in hell working for those women, for men who don't help women. Um, <laughs> and, and so there's a lot of this, you see the signalings that goes on in meetings, you know, where you're, you're not making sure that people, as this was one of the pr first principles of Cheryl's TED Talk, actually, mm -hmm. that be, then became the book, which was, you know, making sure that everybody has a seat at the table. Um, and making sure that everybody's voice is, is heard in, in meetings. And I do think the diversity of boards, of senior leadership, um, and politics um, would make a big difference. I'll, I'll channel one other thing that Cheryl says because I'm, I'm a poli sci major from, from background. It says most of the countries in the world are run by men and that doesn't seem to be going very well. Um, <laughs> so I just think that, that this is something that's early but I'm, I'm, I think it's wonderful for our kids and, and for our coworkers that, that we're at least moving toward better. No, very good. I, um, we, you know, we want to be respectful of your time, and, and, and we're a little bit past 9 o'clock, and we promised you we'd get you out of here and in bed in time for go to work tomorrow. I, um, I you know, do want, do want to close with, um, uh, you know, w with, again, thanking you for joining us. I uh, recently did a presentation at the company and, and was kind of looking at some comments about, um, you know, thing, things that are changing in our world. And I remember one particular article I think Steve shared with me that was, you know, my, our father maybe had one job their entire lives. You know, folks our age maybe have six jobs in our, in our lives. Our kids' kids are going to have six jobs at the same time. And so I, I think, you know, if you, you can't have any drag, you can't have, you know, when we're talking about feeling it and all that kind of stuff, I mean, if it's going to take us two to three years to pivot, you certainly can't take an extra two to three years to think about it. And so for us at ISD, I mean, I, you know, just so you know what we're about, I, please go to the website. Uh, the biggest gift that you can uh, give us is, is to talk about us and, and try to think about someone that would benefit from, uh, from this, our, our program. Uh, was actually approved by the state of California last year as a master's degree program. So we are really uh, a, an only program of our kind. And we have 16 different modules that are run uh, by wonderful leaders just like uh, these. And we will, 
uh, going forward um, have other SD Talks events as well, and all of you are on the list, and we hope you join us. Um, thanks again, and have a wonderful evening.